So I would love to get started by talking about the fact that you are somewhat of an anomaly as far as conventional medicine psychiatry goes, uh, in, in the sense that you have a lot of focus on nutrition. Uh, your new book is This Is Your Brain on Food, and obviously it's focused heavily on the, the interplay of nutrition and mental health and brain health, which is what we're going to be talking about in this podcast. Um, but I'm curious, how did this start for you? Why, first of all, I guess, why do you think it's so unusual for psychiatrists to talk about nutrition? And how did you become sort of an exception to that rule? I think that the way that um, in the U.S. that psychiatrists are trained, I'll start there, is that, you know, we focus on medications and therapy as uh, main methods of treatment. And there's several others which we are also trained and study. But I would say that, you know, for the most part, people are guided towards medications. And here was where I felt there was a problem because having grown up in a home where uh, people, you know, I was during the daytime when I was a kid, spent time with my grandparents because my mom was in medical school. So I learned yoga and meditation really to entertain. They wanted to entertain me and have me learn something. Mm. And it therefore was just very much a part of how I grew up. And for that reason, when I came into the field of psychiatry, I just, I couldn't figure out why we were using and prescribing medications that had devastating side effects. Now, I want to be clear that I still prescribe medications. They are life-saving for many of my patients, but they also have problems. They also really impact our metabolic health. And I was noticing this and wondering why we were not asking other questions. And there were two very life-changing moments in my career, um, which were kind of eye-openers. Uh, one was early on in my psychiatry training, a patient was very upset with me uh, because I he felt I caused him to gain weight from a medication I prescribed, and it was Prozac. And uh, he also had a 20-ounce cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee in his hand, which is a favorite in Boston. And I said to him, partly to distract him, Ari, I said, tell me what you put in your coffee. And this 20 ounce cup, he had more than a quarter cup of processed creamer, and then he added sugar. I said, how many packets did you put in? And he said, six to eight. You know, so when I calculated, I'm not much of a calorie counter for the long term, but I, I was able to show him on my computer what num the number of grams of sugar he was consuming and sort of the processed um, unfortunate ingredients that were in the coffee. The coffee in its own was fine, but he was adding so much to it and the empty calories that he was consuming. And I saw his, from being upset and angry with me, he changed into being, you know, his eyes lit up, it almost like a light bulb went off. And I thought, wow, if he can understand that a simple tweak like that makes such a big difference and can help him maybe lose weight over time or eat healthier, I, I saw the power of it. And that really made me change how I was speaking to all of my patients. Uh, we grew to have a th great therapeutic relationship. He didn't need a high dose of Prozac. He over time lost weight and really was inadvertently my first test patient because I saw the power of interpreting good nutritional advice to someone. And then the other other sort of aha moment with me with with me was an unexpected one where I myself ended up the patient um, and wasn't by choice, but, um, you know, I, I was diagnosed with cancer and when I was facing my first chemotherapy treatment, I found myself, you know, questioning how, why, feeling super anxious, a lot of angst, and partly because I knew exactly the side effects I was about to face that day. And I was making myself a cup of tea that, you know, my grandmother taught me this recipe for a golden chai when I was a kid. And trying to calm myself down. And I realized as I was making that, why was I not leaning into what I knew and what I had been teaching and educating and sort of helping people clinically um, at work to, to do using nutritional psychiatry principles. And, and it's funny, you know, when you're the patient, you sort of lose, lose sight of a lot of stuff because it's such a different situation. And I made a conscious choice to really lean into everything I knew. So I became my own test case, but not, not by choice. And I realized how powerful that every week that I would go for my chemotherapy treatment, you know, my doctors would say, what are you eating? We want to know what you pack for lunch. 
what are you drinking because you just you're coming in and you're doing well and you don't have side effects and it was a very powerful message especially for me um, and these two moments uh, really spearheaded what I feel has become a mission around my book this is your brain on food to help people use nutrition for improvement of their mental well-being and of course it's a holistic model so it's more than that but one of the pillars is nutrition mm -hmm. excellent so I have a, a big question for you. It's okay if this requires a very long, in-depth answer or certain- Like the one I just gave. Many layers of an answer. Well, this, this one's more science-y, less, less personal. Um, so I, I'd like to sort of create an overview for listeners of how nutrition actually interacts with brain health. What are some of the key maybe three four five different physiological mechanisms or pathways that nutrition is actually affecting what's going on in our brain and how that ties into mental health that's a great question Ari. so you know as research evolves uh, we understand that there are different mechanisms by which um the the brain is impacted by food and some of them include things like oxidative stress um uh uh, as well as I think what is the most important, in my opinion, but amongst others, the gut-brain connection. And this is newer science because it really has evolved in the last one to two decades, even though uh, Hippocrates, you know, nodded to this in statements that he made eons ago. Um, and Hippocrates really is considered the father of modern allopathic medicine. It took science a long time to catch up. And now that we understand there is this connection between the gut and brain, we were able to understand further that the gut and brain originate from the exact same cells in the human body, the neural crest cells. These cells then divide up and form two different organs in the body, the gut and the brain, but then they remain connected anatomically by the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve, which I like to call a two-way text messaging system. And they these organs are communicating all the time, but one of the things that we also need to put together is in the gut, we know that serotonin and other neurotransmitters are working. We know that they are involved with the brain, but 90, 95% of serotonin is made in the gut. And also there are several receptors, about 90% of the receptors are there. So you realize then that the gut has this location for serotonin, then there's this communication mechanism. And you realize that as we're eating food and it's getting digested and it's going to the gut, the food is going to interact with neurotransmitters. It's also going to interact with the trillions of microbes that are in the gut microbiome. And those microbes are really there to support our health. We should be taking care of them. Um, and there are trillions of them. But, you know, when our food is broken down, the good microbes uh, on the days that we are eating a healthy meal, the good microbes are able to help with that process. And the breakdown products are things like short chain fatty acids, which are great for the gut, help to lower inflammation and other anti-inflammatory foods, another great way to uh, explain this mechanism. And our days that, you know, if we are consuming more of a sugar laden or say a fast food diet, the the, the, what we need to also understand is the breakdown products of those foods can be very toxic to the gut environment. And there are bad microbes that live alongside the good microbes. And when they are fed with sugar and fast foods and stuff like that, their breakdown products are toxic to the single cell lining of the gut. When they damage that lining over time, uh, conditions like leaky gut arise and the condition in the gut of inflammation is called dysbiosis. So we start to therefore unfold that the, the, the food mood connection evolves based on this connection between the gut and brain. And there are several other mechanisms, anti-inflammatory foods, anti the mechanism of oxidative stress, how we combat that, understanding neuroplasticity and more. So there are many more different ways, but the one that I like, I feel really captures it for people is when you understand how your food is digested and the fact that the actual digestive products impact that environment and impact your gut. It's a, it's a very simple way to think about making that connection come alive for you. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason I focus on it. And I wrote my book based on that. 
So getting into sort of more practical stuff around specific mental health conditions and specific foods, what would you say are some of the biggest specific foods or nutritional factors that relate to one's risk of depression? So the, the foods that you want to be careful about um, are very important because many people consume foods and they worry about their waistline or their weight gain. Um, and they don't realize that these foods are actually impacting their mental health. So the typical Western diet called the standard American diet or sad diet for a reason, um, you know, it's rich in sort of sugar, high fructose, corn syrup, processed, ultra processed foods, uh, lots of stabilizers, food coloring, etc. And they do cause weight gain, but they also um, have very devastating effect on our brain. And so a lot of foods that we consider so-called comfort foods are discomfort for the brain. A lot of foods that are treats, called treats by individuals that actually mistreat the brain. And a lot of the things like artificial sweeteners that disrupt many of the uh, artificial sweeteners are disruptive to the gut microbiome. Um, the unhealthy fats, the hydrogenated uh, fats and the uh, processed vegetable oils are uh, just not great for us because they're disruptive to the gut, they're pro-inflammatory, they upset the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio in the body, um, and gut inflammation ultimately leads to brain inflammation and they become problematic because inflammation is seen as one, one of the underlying mechanisms for things like cognition, cognitive disorders, depression, anxiety, and more. Um, so when we when we break it down in that way, we realize that there are foods that we want to cut back on and be careful about. But the foods that you can lean into, um, one of the biggest foods is fiber. It's 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 one of the nutrients that most Americans don't consume. We tend to be worried about the grams of protein we consume, but we don't consume nearly enough fiber. So a big uh, database study. Uh, show that I think one or two out of every 10 Americans eats enough fiber. Yet fiber, which we get from uh, plants, fruit, uh, beans, nuts, seeds, legumes, and whole grains, uh, actually nurture those gut microbes and feed them. So they need fiber in order to function. So any fiber-rich food is something that you can lean on. Um, prebiotics, probiotics, uh, us, and fermented foods, another huge group that actually can help offset mood symptoms. A study that looked at the use of a probiotic supplement versus Prozac showed that the supplement did better. So even eating a probiotic rich diet can help you. Fermented foods, a huge study from um, a research group out of Stanford, a highly respected group, looked at fermented foods and was published in Cell in summer of 2021. And this showed that actually eating fermented foods and adding this to your diet can reduce the amount of inflammation. So hugely helpful uh, that th those sort of uh, that group of foods, omega three fatty acids, like we mentioned, uh, which you can get from fatty fish, wild caught salmon, um, and other other types of fatty fish. But you also can get plant based sources from things like flax seeds, uh, sea algae, and more. The uh, plant-based sources do have the short chain omega threes less efficiently, um, you know, transmitted to the brain. Let's say, but still worth including including in your diet. So those are just some of some of the foods to think about. And then one of the ones I always like to mention, which I think are the hidden uh, hidden uh, gems in our kitchen cabinet, are spices. Um, saffron and turmeric uh, have been shown to be extremely helpful in terms of mood. Uh, so, so depression, definitely something to consider. And for children, we always add a pinch of black pepper. Yeah. Saffron has some amazing research on it. I am, yes. um, I've been pretty blown away by some of the research on that related to, to mental health. Um, however, it seems like almost all the studies on it come out of Iran and Iran mm -hmm. is uh, also one of the world's biggest exporters Producers. of, uh, of, of saffron. San, uh, saffron. Mm -hmm. And so you wonder about the sort of conflicts of interest always... that, that, that might be present there. I would love to see some, you know, studies on saffron that are done in other countries, but certainly from the research that's there, it seems like a pretty amazing. Certainly a, a good bunch of them do come from Iran. 
the um, saffron supplements that, uh, and the reason I mentioned this is, it's one of the times when a supplement may be helpful to someone. Um, and we do all have nutritional gaps. None of us eats a perfect diet. But I say this because, you know, when you consume food, you just don't use enough saffron. Mm -hmm. And so supplement becomes important. And I've, I've definitely had people um, feel better when they use a saffron supplement because high doses of saffron are used. But as with all research, you know, it's always important uh, for those of you reviewing the research and looking at the different studies to check that the authors don't have conflicts. Yeah. And that may not be a conflict that was, uh, that they needed to uh, actually uh, disclose in a paper because maybe they're not manufacturing the saffron. But it's a good point that mm -hmm. much of the, uh, a very large production of saffron or growth of saffron happens there. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on artificial sweeteners? Do you feel they're so for, safe? Are they safe in yeah. general? Are they a risk for mental health or brain health in particular? So they unfortunately um, don't do well in mental health. For the most part, the older sweeteners, there's some newer ones um, that are showing some, um, I would say some, some better signs in the research, uh, but we don't have all the mental health data on them yet. Um, so for the most part, you know, if you had drinking a diet soda and you have anxiety, that could be very problematic for you. Um, uh, artificial sweeteners can offset symptoms, and I've seen that happen. Uh, one clinical example is someone who was trying to actually give up uh, soda, moved to diet soda, and became more anxious. So even though the sugar-laden soda, the, the, the 20, you know, 20 grams of sugar in a, I think it was a, 12 to 16 ounce uh, bottle or six, uh, maybe 20 ounce bottle um, uh, of soda wasn't great for the brain either. The artificial sweetener unfortunately set up the anxiety. So some of the newer sweeteners, one of them is allulose, um, stevia and erythritol have a better relationship with insulin. Um, so, you know, if I, if I, if my patients come in and they just have to have something sweet and anything in moderation, a little bit of stevia, a little bit of erythritol, a little bit of maybe allulose. Um, there are even newer ones coming out on the market um, that I've heard about through my work with the uh, World Economic Forum. So, you know, what I can say is be careful with sweeteners, use them in moderation, um, really try to move away from things like diet sodas, read to see what sweetener is in them. Um, one caveat is stevia can set off anxiety in people and studies have shown this. So if you do suffer from anxiety, be a little bit careful with stevia because although it's natural, for some reason it doesn't do doesn't always do well in people with anxiety. Interesting. Interesting. Um, what about anxiety? Are there, is it sort of the same as far as, uh, and, and you just mentioned one thing with, with sweeteners there, but is it sort of the same as the list with depression as far as the foods and the nutritional factors that, that affect that? Or are there some key differences? Um, there are some key differences because there are sort of, there are slight nuances with every uh, one of the mental health conditions. Um, you know, with with uh, anxiety, one of the uh, foods that you can lean into is tryptophan, which is a precursor of serotonin, but tryptophan actually has been shown to help anxiety. And in some countries like Canada, it's a, it's a supplement that needs to be prescribed. But you can get tryptophan from things like chickpeas. Uh, you can get it from uh, certainly certain types of poultry. Um, and then there are vitamins that have been shown to be helpful and minerals. And the reason I mentioned the minerals is magnesium is often overlooked, but magnesium can be significantly helpful for anxiety, um, as well as potassium and selenium. You know, you get enough selenium from uh, one or two Brazil nuts a day that you can eat. So that's always a good one to lean into. And then there are some uh, herbs that people often brush aside as unimportant, but lavender, passion flower, and chamomile can act actually help people with anxiety. And then uh, vitamins they can lean into are vitamin D, we mentioned sunlight, um, tender, tenderness of outdoor time, uh, vitamins B1, B6, um, A, C, and E. So the foods, you know, and what I did in my book are is in the final chapter, share recipes, but for these different foods and these different vitamins, I list the vitamin and the type of food. So people have a checklist that they can go to uh, because it's hard to remember everything. 
you recommend uh, supplementing with broad spectrum vitamins and minerals. Um, will any, you know, over the counter multivitamin product work for that? Or do you have more specific recommendations in that regard? I, I do. And I wish I could give you a list of 10 or 20 or 30. And even the manufacturers wish there were 10 or 20 or 30. <laughs> it's hard to get other companies interested in going into this. Um, people often ask me the question, Ari, a little differently. And I, I just want to mention, they'll say, um, if I buy one of these one a day type of vitamins, which with every passing year, they're adding more and more minerals to them. We still call them one a day vitamins. Um, is that a bad thing? And I always say, no, it's not bad. I mean, I, any amount of additional nutrients you can get um, is probably a good thing. But you have to look at how they differ from the ones that have been shown to be therapeutically beneficial, okay? And there has never even been an anecdote that I'm aware of, of anybody um, improving their depression or anxiety by taking the over-the-counter formula. Mm. And when I tell you the two ways they're different, it'll make perfect sense. Mm -hmm. One is the dose. The over-the-counter ones are typically about 20% of the REA and the recommended dietary allowance. And the recommended dietary allowance is based on, you know what it's based on? Have you ever heard this story? Uh, I'm quizzing I, you again so you can edit I, it out. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I, I was, <laughs> no, I, I actually, I don't. I don't think I know where you're going with that. Okay, so it was based on what, what it was believed to take to keep World War II soldiers able to march, basically, mm. and fight. Mm -hmm. So it's based on healthy young individuals who did not have a mental disorder and who they were only concerned about physical health and they were eating well in addition. So it has nothing to do with treating a mental health problem. So not surprisingly, RDA is a very, very low bar. Now, um, that doesn't mean that any of the broad spectrum formulas that have been studied are mega doses, they are not. Uh, but there is this broad area between the RDA, which is quite low, and the tolerable upper level at which you have, there has occasionally been a report of a toxicity and all of the broad spectrum formulas fall in that range. So they are a higher dose. They're also in balance. They also have a broader spectrum. So the main thing is the dose and the spectrum. So I mentioned that the kind of one a day type, and I don't mean to be referring to one a day as a brand, the one a day type of um, uh, vitamins and minerals have increased the number of their minerals, but they're still very few. And the reason is, I think, is that they know they have to start telling people to take more than one pill a day because it's yeah. hard with minerals to get them into a single pill. You know, yeah. I always say, think of the Rocky Mountains where I live, you know, <laughs> minerals are bulky. So anyway, and the broad spectrum formulas are simply based on what is known about brain function. And so there are roughly 50 vitamins and 15 minerals and a few antioxidants too, in very small amounts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I know quite a bit about this kind of problem. I'm cause I have my own supplement brand. That's and, right. I just remembered that. Yeah. And, and, um, I have basically all, almost all my formulas are not in capsules actually for this reason, because one of the things that I do differently from pretty much almost every other brand out there is I'm, I'm using real dosages of these ingredients that I'm putting in my formula, whereas most other supplement companies are putting in one tenth or one twentieth the effective dose. And there is a physical mass problem that you encounter when you are doing what I'm doing, which is if you want to put in, let's say to a brain formula, you want to put in 15 different ingredients, all at real clinically effective, you know, the studied doses that have been shown in research to be effective. All of a sudden you've got four grams of powder. It doesn't fit into one capsule or two capsules or three or capsules, you know? Um, so, and I have that problem with all my supplements, including my multivitamin and mineral formula for the exact reason that you said, um, so most of them end up being powders or they end up being at least five capsules or so, so, uh, per serving. So, 
um, yeah, in, in general, if somebody's saying, hey, take this multivitamin, multimineral supplement, and it's easy to take, it's only one pill a day, that's pretty much a, a dead giveaway that it doesn't have adequate amounts of everything that you need if they crammed it into one capsule. And I find that many people don't understand this. They don't understand that there is a physical mass. You can't just condense all the stuff into one capsule. There's a, you know, you, you have to deal with the laws of physics in that regard. So, yeah. So does anybody ever report improved mental health on uh, any of the formulas you make? For sure. So oh, yeah. when are you going to yeah. do a study, Ari? I know. Because well, actually, I would like, uh, believe it or not, I was hoping to pick your brain a bit on that um, after after we record this podcast. I, I've okay. been speaking with a few researcher friends of mine about how I can how I can start to do some studies, hopefully in a way that doesn't cost millions of dollars to to conduct. Okay. So um, yeah. I would okay. love to pick your brain in that regard. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So... As far as, so beyond supplements, beyond uh, multivitamin, multimineral supplements, what about food? What about nutrition? Mm. What, what are your recommendations there as, you know, as far as uh, optimizing mental health? Is there a particular dietary pattern that you're recommending to follow? And what are sort of the, the core principles of how one should eat to optimize their brain health and mental health? So the latest research from the U.S. government, it's only a few months old, shows that only one third of the caloric intake of American children um, has any micronutrients in it. Whoa. Okay. They are one, I'm not sure I got the verb right. Let me say it a different way. 67% of the caloric intake of children under the age of 19 comes from ultra processed chemical packages. So we have an entire generation or two of children who are feeding their brains at about one third of what our ancestors were eating because they're not eating real food. By the way, if you look at the American data, this is US, this is the NHANE survey data. I can send you the references if you want from the US government. Um, if you look at the adults, it's a little better. It's 57% instead of 67%, but it's still pretty terrible. Yeah. And the results, the data from the UK are about 65%. And the Canadian data, it's a little outdated, but it's over 60%. So it's all, it's a Western world problem. We are, I mean, just like the pharmaceutical companies control what goes into our treatments, the food companies control the non-food products, which we are eating they have influenced a whole multiple generations of people that it's okay not to eat real food. So the number one thing to do is what Michael Pollan says, eat real food. He also said not too much and mostly plants, but for the topic we're discussing, eat real food or what Andy Weil, Dr. Andrew Weil used to call even before Michael Pollan was on the scene, he said, true food, you have to eat true food. Mm -hmm. And just doing that, you'll be feeding your brain much better. Um, yeah. I know, I know in the book, you talk quite a bit about the Mediterranean diet as sort of a, 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 a good base dietary template to follow. Um, why not something more trendy like the keto diet? Yeah. I'm glad you asked that. So first of all, if you go back and look, I think every time we said Mediterranean, we put Mediterranean style diet mm -hmm. um, because nobody really knows anymore what's the Mediterranean diet. Does it require sit down dinners with family and friends? Some people would say yes, red yeah. wine, you know, et cetera. Okay. Yeah. The point is that if you look at the a graph of the Mediterranean style diet food, it's real food. It's fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds. It's depending on if you're a pescatarian or a vegetarian or whatever get your protein from different sources it's whole grains and it's olive oil and it's learning how to cook with lentils beans and legumes are where you will save your money and enrich your diet so that's why it's the first step toward getting what your brain needs and as you increase that you will not have room for those ultra processed chemicals that some people call ultra processed foods but i refuse to call foods they're ultra processed 
non-foods. Mm-hmm. So why that better than a, tr- you said it yourself, trendy. Ket- there are all kinds of trendy diets that come and go. Ketogenic is fascinating to me because I used to work in an epilepsy unit for a while um, when I was more in the neurosciences and the ketogenic, this was 50 years ago, ketogenic diet was all the rage, you know? Um, but, and I know it's had tremendous effects for some people. But um, let's step back and remember that we're talking about mental health. And if you're talking about mental health, you're dealing with people who probably aren't feeling very good about themselves, um, even if they're not outright depressed. The last thing they need is a failure experience. Mm -hmm. And some of these diets, we call them, we don't call them trendy diets. I think in the book, we call them restrictive diets. They're hard to follow. Even a gluten-free diet is hard to follow. And some people don't need a gluten-free diet. So we don't say you shouldn't do any of those, but we're just saying, don't make it your first step. First, eat real food. See how much better you can get on that. And then if you want to, if you decide maybe, um, you know, you really do think you might be gluten sensitive, go on a gluten-free diet. If you think you really want to try intermittent fasting, try it. But first, get rid of the rubbish. Mm -hmm. That's my philosophy. Are are there any specific foods or supplements beyond broad spectrum nutrient supplementation? Like super things that you would put in the in the category of superfoods, super herbs, super, super supplements of various kinds. Anything that has jumped out to you that has really impressed you as far as its ability to improve brain health and mental health. Actually, um, the simple answer is no. I mean, certainly omega three fatty acids are important for building and maintaining our cell walls, um, and that's true throughout our brain and body. Um, There are herbs like turmeric that are very well supported for arthritis, kinds of pains, inflammatory things, but I don't think there's any evidence of it being particularly relevant for brain health. So for brain health, if we just stick to mental health, I would just say, eat real food and get rid of the rubbish. Don't try a restrictive diet first because you might find it too hard and you'll feel like a failure and this is not the way to go. You want to feel good about yourself. Do all the other things, exercise, meditation, family support, etc. And you can transform. I know people transform their lives doing that, even without any kind of supplementation. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to nutrition. What? And I know you've you've talked about uh, DHA and B12 so far. Um, look at my memory. Isn't that impressive? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, people don't even know what DHA is because when you talk about omega-3s, everybody looks at the EPA. Mm-hmm. But it's actually the DHA when it comes to your brain health. And it's, it's such, uh, it, uh, it makes your cells more fluid. It makes electricity move faster through your brain. Like that's one of the, I could go on forever about DHA. So <laughs> it's, it's one of the ones I talk about the most. So yes, but I'm, I'm proud of you for remembering DHA because it's not, not a lot of people have, have looked at or talk about DHA. Yeah. So what, what are, are there any other significant nutrients of note? And I, maybe I have two questions here. One is, are there any aspects of things that that people are eating that are known to be harmful to the brain that people are maybe not aware of and should be aware of Um, and then maybe is there anything you can build on as far as b12 and dha any other uh, nutrients or foods that are particularly particularly supportive of brain health absolutely i mean this is another one i could talk about all day with nutrition and brain health I, i know you could too right um So I'm going to start from a really high level and go back to individual physiology. So it's really different for every single person on what your body needs. And the FDA has our recommended allowances, but most people don't even know how they're, what they're consuming, if that even falls in those guidelines. So the first thing I always recommend for people to do is to test themselves. And I use a great app called Chronometer. It's free. There's a hundred of them out there. My plate, but my plate doesn't go down. So chronometer goes down to the micronutrient level. So you can measure your food for two weeks and see what you're lacking. Now, of course, it's the FDA recommendations, but at least start there. 
and then test what works for yourself. Test taking out dairy, test taking in different foods. Um, but I, you know, I want to be careful when I talk about that because fat is a critical component for our brain health. And we've had the past 30 years of fat is bad, don't eat fat. It makes you fat, which is a complete lie that we now know, right? Yes, fat is high in calories. So if you're only eating fat and you're plus, plus you're eating a bunch of carbs, you're, you're going to get fat. But fat is hugely important for your brain health. Your brain, I, off the top of my head, I think it's 80% of your brain is actually fat. So critically important for your brain health and the rest of your body. So that's another huge nutrient. But most people don't certainly don't get enough fat. Um, and any particular type of fat, I mean, DHA is obviously uh, an important fat that's linked to brain health. Are there some distinctions that you want to make as far as fats that are either healthier or less healthier, healthy for brain health? Right. I mean, you're, it, and that does kind of go back to the old studies around saturated fat versus unsaturated fat, like avocados are one of the best fats you can eat and, and your fishy fats. Um, you know, you're, you, your omega-3s, your omega-6s, and your omega-9s, all very important fatty acids. So those, and again, I'll just go back to, there's some things I just recommend everybody to supplement with. I mean, unless you're eating, you know, a, a filet of salmon a night, which they do in Sweden. So that's probably why they're all so fit. But, um, you know, supplement with these. But fat is, fat is a critical component. And so are so many of the other micronutrients. Um, folate, I know a lot of people have folate issues, which goes back to the B12. Um, but a lot of people don't absorb folate. So that's another, I'm going to talk from kind of the big picture again. So when you're measuring, so what I'll do is I'll take two weeks on chronometer and it'll tell me down to the micronutrient level. And, and for some reason, I'm always kind of lacking in the irons and the zincs and the coppers, like the metals. Um, so I know that that's what I should supplement with. But then you also have to take it one step further and measure your blood tests and get everything measured. And you usually want to do it a couple different times because it's a snapshot in time, right? If I go get my blood tested tomorrow, it's just going to be dependent upon what I've eaten the last few days. So you want to do it over time to see what is lacking as well. And then supplement with either food or food and diet or supplements. When I say supplement, I don't always mean a pill. I, I mean, take more of that food in. Um, so that's really key because what's happening, I think, is with our processed food, like you talk about what not to eat, sugar, of course, everyone's beating up on sugar, but I'm going to say it even with your brain health has been high correlations of the amount of sugar people eat and dementia and stroke. Stroke is a huge one when it comes to sugar intake. Salt is another one. Um, the average American eats over 3,500 milligrams of salt a day, and you're only supposed to have 1,500 by the FDA standards, which I think is even still probably high. Um, and that's going to get to things like give you kidney problems later in life. But salt is another one where it's not very good to have that excess salt in your brain. So it, it your general heart health and food health diets, you know, I'd, I'd always recommend the Mediterranean diet it seems to be the best balanced one. You get good fats like your olive oils and olives um, and certain cheeses and fish, a lot of fish and lean meats and things like that. Um, trying to think here. So yeah, I, I mean, I always kind of take it from that level because it, it is so independent and per person that it's hard for me to say, you know, well, you should be going out and eating this percentage of your diet of fat and carbs and protein when that may not be what's right for you. And, you know, as I'm hearing you talk kind of and, and say, you know, a lot of people could use more fat and less sugar, I think maybe one distinction is important. Are you saying that people should go out and eat as much fatty red meat as possible and avoid things like blueberries, which are rich in sugar, or are you trying to get at something else? Thank you for making that distinction, because <laughs> I know that you know that one. No, natural sugars are fine. Um, it's the added sugars. In 1975, uh, high fructose corn syrup was introduced in this country, and the epidemic of obesity with the introduction of high fructose corn syrup is just a one-to-one -one correlation. Mm -hmm. It's an absolutely 
everything, your breads, your ketchups, any, I mean, salad dressings, anything you think is, you know, the only thing it's not in is your natural foods, um, your fruits and vegetables. It's even in your chickens. Like they pump chicken now with sugar water to make them look bigger. Mm. So you want to really be careful with this. And, and like when I went shopping for my dad to look for low sodium, all those meats that you get that are already, you know, pre-packaged, those, and even that your deli meats, tons of sodium. I had asked for specific low sodium meats. Mm. Uh, but yes, natural fruits, I think, are, are good for you. Um, blueberries specifically, you, you, know, you nailed it on the head, is one of the brain-boosting foods. Um, tons of antioxidants in blueberries, which is great. You've got to get rid of those free radicals flying around your brain. Um, you know, flax seeds are really good for your brain. Chia seeds avocados, asparagus, a lot of, a lot of your foods that are good for your heart and your health are also good for your brain, but natural fruit, natural sugars are okay. Mm -hmm. um, are there any brain superfoods or herbs or, you know, various kinds of, of plant, you know, foods, botanicals, things like that, that, that you think are really special in terms of their uh, effects on the brain? Absolutely. And I, we actually, we, we have a monthly newsletter and we just said, are your superfoods so super? <laughs> and the point of that was that, yes, your superfoods, like your blueberries, I just mentioned a lot of them, spinach, avocados, um, chia seeds, flax seeds, walnuts, very, very good for your brain. Um, of course, fish that I've talked about, your fatty fish, your salmons, a lot of anchovies and sardines. But what you have to be careful of when you're looking at that, and that's why I talked about are they so super, is you want to prepare, and a lot of spices like turmeric and things like that, but you want to prepare them yourself. Anytime you buy the pre-processed, uh, you know, your pre-cut carrots or your pre-processed, even turmeric, um, pre-processed turmeric, they're taking out so many of the nutrients and vitamins that it's just better to, to just buy the root and shave it yourself. Hmm. But to make your superfoods even more super, you really should be taking the whole food and making yourself. And of course, it's more time consuming, but it's much more time consuming to be sick and have a disease. Food, fuel, nutrition, that encompasses, you know, even detoxification, encompasses essential oil. So any fuel you put into and onto your body, that's what it, you know, that's this category there. What I um, love doing and one of my favorite things to do, uh, it's a low barrier of entry into the whole food and nutrition is creating a superhuman brain smoothie or superhuman brain shake. And I have my, my recipe right there, seven steps, creating your super brain smoothie. So we have greens. So some sort of leafy greens I tend to use in, in every of my smoothies and I, and, with all these, I cycle what it is. Like for example, for greens, I might do spinach one week, and then the next week in all mine, I'll do kale, and then the next one, again, I just cycle, I, you know, bok choy, uh, Swiss chard, uh, and I love it because you get your new, you, you know, you get people saying, I don't like vegetables. This is the perfect way to do it. Yeah. With that greens, some sort of liquid, I've been using bone broth lately, as my liquid, but it could be coconut water, uh, coconut milk, almond milk, and just, or just regular water. Healthy fat like avocado, flax seeds, chia seeds, some frozen or fresh vegetables, some frozen or fresh, fresh fruit, maybe a protein source if you wanna get a little bit more protein. And then you can always top it off with some other spices and supplements like, uh, like Ceylon cinnamon to decrease blood sugar to help with blood sugar, to man, I should say manage blood sugar rather than decrease. Uh, turmeric, that's another good option. Ginger, I think those are the main three that I, I tend to, to use in mine. Quite a bit of cinnamon, I, I like that, and it also gives yeah, it a, a good taste. Yeah. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's a simple, easy thing to do. Now, one like master tip that I've just started incorporating to make sure you're not breaking down the protein and just like all the enzymes with it, because I used to just put it all in the Vitamix and just mix it all up. Now I've, I've add 
the protein powder, and I tend to use like a more of a bone broth protein powder, a plant-based protein powder, organic. And I'll add it at the end and just like stir it in, either with like a shaker ball or just like on a one setting, just so it's not breaking it down even more. So we'll see how that goes and how that changes it with how I feel. Because I, I intuitively knew I'm like, it's probably not good just to mash it all in there. But now the more that I, again, I'm still learning, the more I learn, I'm going to test it out and see how it does. Yeah. I have to say, you know, I, I, um, I think this tip is shockingly powerful if you implement it. Um, I, I have a smoothie almost every day and, uh, I, it's actually kind of mind blowing, like how much good stuff I can pack into a smoothie, all kinds of different superfoods, um, uh, you know, multivitamin and multimineral, you know, greens, superfoods, powders, um, acerola and acai and, and, um, what's the one I've been experimenting with a lot lately. It's, uh, uh, geez, the bear, it's a different kind of berry. Goji? It's, um no 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 it's a it's a real oh. deep purple berry um aronia that's the one oh. aronia berry it's uh it's killer got this amazing taste to it and maki berry and spirulina and like you can just throw so much good stuff into a smoothie and with with berries and you know with some of the other things that you have listed here um you you it actually tastes it ends up tasting good whereas a lot of these things if you were to use them by yourself you know, it would be pretty hard to get down in significant quantities. So I think just this one tip, if you in, implement it and take advantage of the superfood aspect, like dump lots and lots of superfoods into a smoothie, I think it just, it's super powerful. 